literally fucking twenty minute fucking long haul. <laughs> I like that. From. We'll start. So this is actually great to get all four of you. So I'm excited. Yeah. It's Jason the Metal Conjure here with Kyle Rasmussen, Stephen Ellis, Adam Rosberger, and Jason Westmoreland. Damn. Out of the memory. Yeah. Uh, so okay. it. Appreciate it. It's, it's I been... couldn't have done that. <laughs> that quickly. Yeah. yeah just Who the fuck are you guys? <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of qualities. My memory is one of them, so I'll take That's that to awesome. my bank. Yeah. So um, a lot has a lot has changed. Sorry, real quick. Sorry, a lot has changed, like, and everything, you know. And I would talk to you guys after the Vader show, and you know, like the thing with Christian. It was just all all excited because, yeah. like, I was, and then just a few weeks later, everything changed, you know. Yeah. So, uh, just to talk about the time off only, and that's it. Uh, the one theory I'll say, at least for bands, is maybe that all this time off that people can, like, work their jobs more, maybe pay this off, maybe this. I'm hoping there was some kind of benefit having this much time off. What was it like for the band in general in terms of that, picking up you know, new music again, or just anything just in general about the time off you guys had? Yeah, um, it was, I don't want to say it was a blessing in disguise. I mean, it was just, it was shot. You know, like having your whole, uh, especially coming off the tail of your debut album and you have all this great support lined up. So it was a drag. But with that being said, um, it was a great opportunity to get a head start on the second record. I know we have fans that are really, and our label, <laughs> that are very eager to see what we're doing next. So, and if we kept, we, we had so many great opportunities coming that it was a double edged sword. You know, if we were busy touring for the next full year, then that's a, you know, an extra year without a record. So we, we tried to, we weren't prepared mentally to work, start working on the new album so soon, but we didn't waste much time. We knew what we were in for and we knew we had to keep working. So we started toiling away at that and we're, and it's been a beautiful thing, man. We're nine out of ten songs uh, structured out for the next record, and that's something that, uh, yeah, we probably would maybe just be starting now if uh, that hadn't happened. So between that, you know, just personal stuff uh, for all of us that were different. I started a business. My my job before uh, that was I was a body piercer. So with COVID, I couldn't obviously go back and do that. So it was, uh, you know, either go work at a grocery store or figure something out. So I started making spike guitar straps. Oh. I went and worked at a grocery store. <laughs> you went and worked at a grocery store. <laughs> that was my old job for 14 years before my pre new job. Yeah. So yeah, I know what that's yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, did that. That's been cool. Hard as shit. Got real overwhelmed between the band and that and COVID and got real depressed for a little while. And you know, it's been a, it's been a battle, but it's cool. It's uh, I, I feel like, uh, we kicked COVID's ass. You know, I feel I feel good about it. I'm hoping we'll get back to some kind of normal, you know, until that point. But uh, speaking of, like, changes earlier, there's two new members of the band. And I like to ask, uh, like, how that kind of came to be um, with this. Because, like, this lineup, like, as great as the other shows were with uh, Cattle and Vader, like, I got to really see, like, I was talking about the, like, the drumming of Jason that yeah. a lot of the music can open up and, like, yeah. there's just more that can happen. So yeah. I'm just really curious about the changes, you know, since you guys are the mainstays of the band. Uh, tell me about the additions of Steven and Jason and, like, how it came to be. Do you want to talk? Sure. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, I mean, Steven goes way back with us. And uh, actually on that Vader tour that we did, uh, Steven came out and did uh, merch for us. I was promoted. Uh, so he's been, uh, we, uh, we lost our other guitar player and, uh, we had short time. We had, um, uh, cycle Las Vegas coming up, uh, earlier this year. We, yeah. uh, we played in, in August and, uh, we were about six weeks out and needed another guitar player. So, um, uh, since we go way back with Steven, we asked him, uh, if he'd come out and, and play some shows with us and, uh, he kindly obliged. Steven, actually, if I can interject <laughs> just for a second, Steven actually, uh, was one of the first guitar players to formally audition for the band back in 2012. Oh wow. Yeah. When the yep. very first EP came out, because we go way back. And uh, his playing just wasn't quite there yet, but he had 10 years to <laughs> get there. And now he's fucking, now he's a lot better at a lot of shit than I am. So it's a really cool, uh, uh, you know, full full circle story. And uh, we were feeling it out. He had another project he was 
passionate about and um not taking over now you're well, that's fine over. you good yeah, like, so, y'all can speak. Anyone uh, can speak. For, of course, I want to hear from everyone. You know, yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, I mean, so yeah, we took Stephen out, and uh, and we also had uh, Pierce Williams from uh, Skeletal Remains uh, helped us out uh, to do a couple of shows for that uh, Psycho run, and then uh, but he's committed with those guys. So uh, coming up on this tour that we just did, uh, we needed a drummer and and uh, in short time as well. So we reached out to Jason and. Bad motherfucker agreed to to come out with us assholes and uh, yeah, Master Skinsman has been fucking just fucking crushing it night after night. So and on short notice too. So um, yeah, here we are, man. It's been a really successful tour and everyone's gelling really well and everything's going going great. And I was gonna say like just like just you know when you go from the tour in the East Coast and you're coming all the way here, you just you don't know you know how to turn out. You hope, of course, but yeah. tonight it was just like. It was just it was so pleased. It was great. Oh, yeah. I loved it, you know, like for the band, because I want all of you to be succeed Thank as much you. as possible. So how much like did that Dying Fetus tour in terms of what you noticed there, either merch, traffic online or anything? Do you think did that really translate there and over here if you noticed or what were the real benefits of that tour for the band? I think COVID did a lot to not only develop a hunger in in the fan base for every band, you know, they're just listeners of music because you you cut them off from live music for almost two years. Uh, a couple things happen. They're going to become frenzied and ready f- for some live music. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they also, I, I like to believe that it gave a lot of fans of music an opportunity to develop a more intimate relationship with the bands they like because a lot of us were stuck at home hopefully listening to music in our headphones or whatever. I mean, I can tell you right now between, I don't know if it's just the organic evolution of the band's, you know, touring career, or if it had a lot to do with that downtime. But I mean, every night I'm seeing people shout the lyrics back at me. That's something I haven't seen before. Yeah. And it's every night, you know, and it's like, man, that year and a half, two years, either did a lot to help, people just get excited about the band or the people that were excited about the band dug deeper. Uh, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, it's been great, man. I mean, the, 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 uh, were you at the last one? That, oh no, we talked about that. You yeah. I was at the, uh, San Diego Vader and then the, uh, uh, LA Vader one. Well, if you saw us here last time, couldn't, no, <laughs> you hey, know what he saw us yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was too late. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it was, it's cool, man. It feels great. It feels great. It feels like uh, we didn't skip a beat. And uh, um, yeah, that's it. That's my answer. <laughs> a lot of people coming out saying it's their first show since COVID. A lot of people coming out uh, just hyped, excited, talking about how much they love the show, how much they love uh, being back out again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things that I uh, that I noticed is um, pre-COVID, uh, you know, I was the opening band for these bigger packages like Vader and and, uh, and Cattle. Uh, people were kind of walking in as we were playing, and uh, oh, yeah. on this Dying Fetus run, uh, most everybody that showed up for the entire night was there by the time we started, and I think that shows that there's been a lot more interest in, uh, in vitriol. And again, I think people are just starving for, yeah. for some fucking aggressive music. Yeah, I think it's both, yeah. Definitely. And um, at least uh, for me uh, personally, like with COVID and everything, one thing at least kind of like I feel almost I guess metalheads, we learn things kind of maybe late on because there's so much detail and so much musicianship and technicality and emotion. Drumming has like opened up more for me than ever in my life. Now I hear songs. I hear songs like drumming wise now like more than ever. So when I hear Jason perform yeah. perform and again, like I don't like I could hear like the tempo is like not just like. There's just more of this manipulation of tempo where just I like, feel like the like certain parts you can there's just more you can do because there's just so much more going on and I'm just I'm still like learning and learning I guess um, hearing Jamie say Murad of Ulcerate like over the, this year I think is it's arguably as good as it gets just my personal opinion yeah. like of how gritty is and just opening up more of these details and you said before that you mainly write the songs but the band members will maybe not write riffs but maybe change a tempo part or maybe slow something down or things like that yeah or have so like, uh, uh, um, at what adam's really good at is thinking about uh 
a lot of ear candy, like rhythmic ear candy or like having like, oh, let's have one guitar pause here. And then, you know, all, a lot of the stuff that happens, that kind of interplay. Right. Like dynamic. Between the, yeah, the dynamic interplay between the instruments. Adam is a great ear for that. So a lot of that stuff, when you hear like a pan or like a, or like a moment of suspense, uh, a caught breath or whatever, like that's, that's, he's, he's a great. I think you mentioned before that you said you were like the director and they, these are the ones who make, who also on the stage, working the stage, the director has the main concept of it, but you know, it's not yeah. just all, I, re I remember that detail really well. Yeah. So I mentioned about the drumming, like, like Chase, if you can like chime in, at least um, from your vantage point of all the experience and bands you've, uh, played for it's just this is all a language for me so i like to translate as best i can from your standpoint like what what is their music like how they write how they play that i just i like to hear a drummer's perspective of, of what they do i'm just curious i guess is it's an abstract comment or like question or theory i guess but i'm just curious from your vantage point what is like the, their riffs their style and what is it exactly i'm from a drummer's perspective i'm just curious um, what, what I feel when I first learned the tracks was, uh, a really unrelenting kind of a thing, but with these tripped out parts, um, like there's like, it kind of reminds me of like a really aggressive band that's trying to pressure you, but then they want to flip that like in a way where there's like a pressure but then the pressure changes and flips upside down almost to me which is is really fascinating like um there's parts where i'll have like a really open let's say it's like a a blackened death metal part um but then something i, I keep saying this but something tripped out will happen there's a lot of curveballs a lot and uh i think that was something that caught my attention from the very beginning i was i just didn't know what was happening so that was uh that was it was a growth as a player for me to have to adapt to that um but it's been fascinating to learn and be integrated into something like that because i didn't know what to expect like each song has a little uh something different in it especially some middle sections of some of them um so yeah it's uh a dynamic canvas that's for sure uh, a lot of parts for me to do things that i would like to do and these dudes are awesome enough to let me express the way i like to um so yeah that's i think that's a good answer it's been a, a lot of curveballs that i've enjoyed lots of tempo changes that i, I wouldn't have thought of ever and it's just been awesome to get used to them and like feel the flow live more now because the tempo changes were like hit me so hard at the beginning. And I was like, oh, my goodness, a lot of adjusting right at the last bit of a bar to get to the tempo change. Yeah. Yes, yeah. See, this stuff I can listen to, and that's the stuff that just like matters. Those really important details that we know what it's like. The what we listen to, our heroes, our veteran bands, and as musicians. So that's the stuff I just like to, you know, that's hear awesome. about. And you mentioned too that when you, I, I, I talked about when you were writing guitar, and you said I asked before about it's like you know you you wrote the for the first time you wrote all the guitar parts, so you played them all, and like you said the right side or so was pretty much like the draft of like the riffs of something I believe you said something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, the le the left side left. was I write all the songs right with one side as as one side, and then uh, when I tracked the other side, it was more or less in sort of improvised okay and steven i'd like to ask about that too that um so taking those guitar parts and working together what is your experience as a guitar player with uh, kyle in terms of like how to play his vision your own contributions of course so, and just overall i'd like to just hear more about the dynamic between both of you guitar wise oh, i mean it's from the day from the first day it's been very very seamless because we both have such an immense respect for each other as players and as creative people so there'll be lots of uh you know uh and i remember even like back when the first record was being made we would bs about like different riffs and stuff and um 
honestly, uh, as far as learning the riffs go, it's been um, a real, it's sort of like learning a different language, you know, you learn how somebody else approaches the instrument, you learn how somebody else creates moments of suspense and tension and grandiose heights and then breaks them all down, you know, and um, it's been very exciting to work with these guys on a on a professional level because I get to I get to kind of see things from their perspective and I get to you know in bits little bits and pieces I get to add my own little uh my own little uh sprinkle of sauce on there you know and uh one of the first thing I really would uh when we get back to home I'd really like to start tracking these guys so we can really start moving forward you know tracking is in for the new record you mean or just uh yeah okay and I'm sorry go ahead uh what I like what I think Steven's presence has really I my approach to guitar has always been I've always prioritized the creative vision the ambition of the vision and then the emotive energy over everything else. So I'm fine being a slightly looser player in terms of the scope of technical metal. Right. And I think Steven is a tighter player than I am in the sense that he's, um, his right hand is more defined. So it's kind of, he creates this bedrock that allows me to be, to kind of writhe around on top of. And I think it keeps the sound. And then with Ch Chasen's drumming, it's funny that you mentioned, you mentioned something about it, kind of an element of transparency. And it's not the first time he's heard that. And I've been thinking about that, why that is. And I, the first thing that I noticed about Chasen's drumming that was so special is when you're playing metal this extreme, you're usually, compromising speed for power or you're compromising power for speed and this freak of fucking nature doesn't have to compromise mm -hmm. either like, <laughs> yep. yeah, it's, it's true. And what that really. does is it's not just like cool i mean it is that but what it the effect that it has is like taking a compressor off of something because he's able to a lot of guys that are blasting fast so it's kind of this wash of, because the hits, the velocities are so similar. So it's just kind of this level playing field. But when you have a guy that's actually hitting his drums, you get these shooting highs, and then you get the dissipation of the, the reverberations of the drums and the cymbals and the wash of the cymbals. So he's creating with his power so much more explosive dynamic, and that allows other things, that allows the drums to dominate when they're dominating, and then kind of fall back when he has that moments of restraint and i think what it does is it creates this environment that the strings get to kind of with and it, it i don't want to say it creates the illusion of more transparency but it's not like he's playing less fucking notes you know what i mean it's not like less is not in this you know, vocabulary so it's, it's not that it's not that you're hearing more of the stuff that's going on because he's not playing as much it's how he's playing it and it kind of creates plays a trick on the ear that things are kind of shuffling to the forefront and then the drums are here and then the guitar is here and then whatever um so between that and and how tight of a player because oh, every player has their strengths but i would say steven is definitely the tightest guitar player vitriol has had with myself included okay and that really it's a very special glue between these guys. I mean, even our A and R guy from our label was like, "That's maybe the best time I've seen you guys." So uh, I would say so personally for me. Awesome. And and you mentioned too about like the styles. Like it's almost like like when Must it'd be Mustaine and you know Freeman Mustaine and someone yeah. Freeman would be you know the Mustaine would be like the more like emotionally you know fast picking solo parts, and you can tell Marty has you know that way that he would just. Yeah, ben, got like, the sauce. Right. Sauce. So that's why I try to hear, like, who's the more, like, emotional player and or the and someone who's also, you know, like, more, either more, again, refined, the one yeah. with that, a bit of it, you know? So yeah. it's good to, I guess, hear the contrast and everything. Yeah. And you're right. You, I... I think the band, like, all the reps from the Dying, you know, Fetus show and then, you know, again, COVID, just all these things, I feel like the band is, like, getting this extra level of, you know, time and playing in front of people and just getting more time than ever because i'm hoping and i'm expecting 
that you guys are going to now try to tour as much as possible oh, if yeah. permitted, that right? That was always the plan. Yeah. Right. We weren't going to stop, and, and then COVID happened, so. Wait, you guys weren't? Oh, oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> back, back, back on the horse. <laughs> and, actually, and I was mentioning before that, like, I think it was either announced this morning or yesterday, this amazing tour coming up in February. Like, number one, the band is actually not opening, opening the band, the bill. Like, you actually, you know, move up a slot, because you yeah. mentioned before that trying to get out of that, even if the bills are really great, to try to, you know, get a little more head on the support. So, Defeated Sanity and Skeletal Remains, like, I mean, I've never seen Defeated Sanity, so that's a that's going to be a joy. Oh, I, for a dream. oh I, amazing. I can't wait. They're amazing. So, how did, how did that tour uh, come about? Just, yeah, nothing too exciting. Just our manager was like, hey, this came across my desk. And basically, you know, they'll pitch... People will ask about Vitriol. Hey, is what would Vitriol be in- interested in this? I don't know if it was their booking agent or what, but uh, when I heard Defeated Sanity, I was like, "Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah." Easy. I don't give a fuck who else is on the fucking tour. You know what I mean? Like they're such a um, profound inspiration to me. Not necessarily like st- like obviously we don't sound anything like them, but as far as their approach, the commitment to extreme music, their commitment to um, the underground in terms of spirit, not in terms of like fuck success. Like I don't think that's where they're, what they're about. But uh, you know they've they've uh, they're such a special band. I mean they've brought this um concern for the real. Like everything's always dirty and filthy, but it's coming from like top tier level musicians, and it's like so fucking rare you get someone with a goddamn balls to do that. You like a I mean? Gruber, um, the drummer, he uh, played in Ingurgentain Oblivion's last record. I don't know if you've heard that a few years haven't. ago. It's there's a 22 minute song in there of it, with his style <laughs> of uh, hell yeah. No, it's um, hell it's yeah. on the same level I mentioned before about the bands like Augury, Anada, yeah. uh, Ulcerate. Uh, oh, I, I, yeah. Um, I'm probably the like the non official spokesperson of that band, and I wish they would play here, but it's like Necrophagus, their album that was supposed to be never came up, a record label yeah. thing. But same with Augury. Yeah. Yeah, I was well, waiting for that new record. record. They did. Nobody gave a shit. Illusion, Go- Illusion yeah. Golden Age. They did. They put out a record. Uh, uh, two, two or three like, years ago? Yeah, like 2017, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Did we listen to it? Yeah. Oh, damn, like Patrick's it. vocals are still amazing, but I feel like that album, it, it was like nine years since Fragmentary Evidence, so it felt like they were still like getting used to each other, and the songs are like, they're not bad, but they're not the first two records. And again, as a big fan, I can be objective. There, yeah. It's not quite the same, but right. his yeah. vocals are arguably better than ever, though. I mean, so that was it. Evidence? Evan, yeah. Vocal? Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. That album. Yeah. I told him before that tour that um that all um the, the three guys wrote each of the three songs, each three, three, three. Yeah. Patrick, Matthew, and uh, Forrest yeah. wrote three and three and three. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing that it flowed as well as it did with that being said cool yeah like so that's what that's the kind of like bit, like stuff i'm really into this is like ingurgitating i put vitriol in that group of just again it's uncomfortable it's different it's not the same you know like structures like you know there's changes in the riffs temp- temples manipulated constantly so that's the stuff i'm just trying to learn about and oh, yeah. figure actually, out you know yeah, i mean especially when you're playing high speed or you want to keep the intensity on all the time it's bigger you know jason was commenting about the tempo changes and we if, if, if you know you want to be blasting most of the time, you have to create dynamic somewhere if you don't want to just numb the listener. And so by making unpredictable tempo changes, by changing up how you're assaulting the person, I think can do a lot to keep the mute, to keep the listeners connected to something that's just like hammering you nonstop. Mm-hmm. And um, I mentioned before, like how it's, I always find it fascinating when we, a band that we particularly like individually that like how you got there, like, how'd you hear about that band? And you'll never forget that moment or whatever it was. And for this band, I mentioned before I interviewed Kelly Schaefer of Atheist and we're talking about this and this. And he mentioned your former drummer, like, Oh, that, Oh, he's good. You got to hear that band. And then when I heard the band, it's like, it is, it's something that musically, like it came with me and emotionally. And I mentioned this because over COVID, the band shows a lot of the tattoo work that all these fans and these, like, it's yeah. not just like a gimmick, like they do the real thing yeah. and they do more of it. And it's great to see that people connect in that way from the imagery and the yeah. vocally and lyrically and yeah. all that for that. What, um, what do you believe people, the fans you've talked to and your experiences and your vibes in general, 
what do people gravitate towards vitriol? What do you believe is something that, again, whether it's the music itself or again the imagery, like the tattoo dedication, like the, yeah. on their you know skin forever? What is it that you feel that people really connect with that either you think been successful let them know or something brand new that I didn't know we connected people in this way? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd say I'd like to believe. And it's not just an assumption. I mean, people say, I mean, just tonight, some guy came up and um, thanked me for the honesty of, of the music. And to me, that's always been, especially in a genre that's so rife with bravado and posturing and a lot of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like being able to, I mean, it's hard music. Um, but I make, I, it, the music I make comes from a place of vulnerability and self-exposure. And, uh, while it's, the music's caustic and the message can seem kind of superficially caustic, ultimately, I like to say that Vitriol's voice is tough love. They're tough love. You know what I mean? Like a lot of grand, we have some songs that are just about like fucking murdering folks. And like, that's a good time. <laughs> but generally Not. speaking, it's about, it's about finding yourself through adversity. It's, it's about, it's about value and suffering. And I think a lot of people out there, when you're living in hell on earth, or something, let's say you have a rough home life, you live in a rough neighborhood or whatever, it's really hard to find value for a why. And I think Vitriol's message says your conditions are unkind, but there's food there. And I think people find a lot, and it, it allows you, for me, what I wanted to do for the fan, well, what I, the message I wanted to put forth was what the most important thing that heavy metal gave to me growing up, which was it made me feel strong in my suffering. It made me feel as though that I wasn't suffering for nothing and that through adversity, you become a better version of yourself. And I think a lot of people feel very, like I know Victim, our song Victim is a, is a, consistently powerful one for our fans because of the message uh which is to not be one um uh even parting of a neck its lyrics are much more um figurative but ultimately i think a lot of people pull out you know uh destroying yourself to purify yourself and i think when you talk about that because it's real like the power of that's real if you're able to talk about that, especially from a place of experience, it can give people, I don't want to say hope, hope is the wrong word, but purpose, you know, and feel like they're, um, you almost, you almost feel grateful for it. You know, if you follow that road down far enough, you feel grateful for it. And then you start leaning into it, you know, and it's I almost think a that, assurance. Yeah. In a way. Sorry. Yeah, I'm good man. Thank you so much. Leave me hanging. Yeah, uh, without waxing too far. I mean, I'd say that that's it's that um, we're trying to lift people up. You know, I don't think that was really the like. I didn't think about that going into it. I think more. You know, I made art music from a personal place, and it was to lift myself up. You know. Um, and not hide from the shit and not hide from the truth, no matter how ugly it might be. Uh, I like to, and may, uh, hopefully our riffs are sick, you know, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the band's like that too. Yeah. Hopefully people like us. <laughs> but yeah, man, I mean, one of the most powerful experiences I had was on our, I think it was the first tour we played in Texas and there was a guy that was waiting by the merch booth all night to chat with me and. Um, uh, victim particularly was the song that helped him kick his opiate addiction. And as someone who was 
struggled with an opiate addiction myself. Uh, I can't tell you how, I mean, I left that show with a, with a level of purpose I couldn't have imagined. I'm like, I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe that I could write a death metal song that would be, provide that amount of wind in someone's sails. You know what I mean? And he was like, man, I just sat and I listened to that song and I read those lyrics and I just had this moment where I'm like, fuck, that's me, man. Like I'm being a fucking victim. That's fucking me. And if vitriol can be that like harsh paternal, like, tough love of like, Hey motherfucker, you're a piece of shit, but you don't have to be. You know what right. I mean? Cause that was the conversation I had with myself. Right. Like that's where it comes from is I was for a very long time, a person I didn't want to be. And so I kind of created this external voice through vitriol. I always say that vitriol is my dad. He keeps me accountable. You know, like I, I project forth through vitriol, what I want to become this ideal. And then through, performing the music and interacting with the fans, I am then held accountable to that standard. And it's like, I can't fall beneath the standard of vitriol. But then I also have to be careful about what I put out there because I'm holding myself accountable. And this, this first album taught me that, you know, you kind of become what you create if you're doing it with integrity, right. hopefully, and you're not wanting to con the fans. That's a long answer. No, that's that, that's why that's why I like to hear that, those are the like self reflection of things that that we grow together with. And I guess I like this kind of particular genre of metal. I call it extreme. That's what I like. Uh, extreme is like extreme metal, extreme music because it did it takes you to that place as you said where uncomfortability, definitely feeling vulnerable, vulnerable. Your worst moments, your your greatest highs, and then knowing that like life is not fair, life is not it's given not, to you. No. It, like you can work for it, and it's things could not could still not work out the point is is just to keep doing what makes you get up that day just fight or die man right fight or fucking die and i believe within like within the passages and like in the the structures and just how different this this stuff is it just i feel more at home with it and i'm like more it's more normal in a way because not just because i hear it so many times but because I've been listening, I guess, this for as long as, you know, you guys for so long, for 20-something years, 25 years. So you just kind of have the ear for it, and then you grow, you grow, and then it's like a puzzle. It opens up, it opens up. Yeah, Certain parts like, of the songs tonight, like, I don't remember that part or that part. Like, that's what you get, and you just never stop learning. Yeah, that's man. what I like to do for that, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, vitriol, like, because it came from a place of love and dedication to the music for, I mean, I started, I went to my first death metal show when I was 13. I'm 33, so... 20 years I've been going to death metal shows and loving death metal. And uh, you develop the vocabulary, like kind of what you're talking about. You, you describe it as putting the pieces of a puzzle together. Yeah. But I like to think of it as like developing a vocabulary, you know, especially if you're into other, like you're into black metal and death metal or whatever, then you can start yep. creating the synthesis of these different languages, these cultural dialects, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And if you revere them and you respect them and you approach them with love and commitment, Hopefully you can create a language that other people, such as yourself, that have love and appreciation for your music, be like, I understand what you're saying. Not only do I understand it, but like, that's awesome. Right. I'm so excited about it. And then you have these people that maybe don't have as robust of a vocabulary and they see it and they're just like blown away because oh, it's so beyond them. Sick. <laughs> and then that is a carrot at the end of the stick for them. And then in that way, onion, onion, vitriol becomes... <laughs> It's not irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. uh, it works. Vitriol is like this <laughs> onion that you can peel away from. And that was important to me, too, is like, I don't want to just alienate the more ground level. Like, for me, like, I, I got into metal because I was an angry fucking kid, man. I was real fucking angry. I'm still pretty fucking angry. I'm working on it. But uh, that at the end of the fucking day. At the end of the fucking day, if you're a death metal band and I don't want to put my head through a fucking wall or through my fucking enemy, then you're not doing your job. And I, no matter how heady and sophisticated our songwriting becomes, I never want to lose that kind of primal connection that, that will transcend all language, right, of the music or whatever. Like, I, is that someone who doesn't even know what death metal is? I want them to be able to come into a vitriol and show and be like, oh, fu oh, fuck, okay. These guys don't want something good for me, you <laughs> know, like, or whatever. Uh, that, that's, that's, and I'm very grateful that we seem to have 
maintain that intensity through our musical journey. I say that's really, really well said. And my last question, I'd say, and thank you all for your time very much. Um, so the tour next year for Defeat Insanity, and what Perfect World, no, it doesn't exist, but Vitriol's Perfect World for next year, what would the band like to do? You said tour as much as possible, the new record, like what, either, what's the plan, I guess? What would you like to happen? Uh, one of the most exciting things for me is getting over to Europe and doing some, uh, doing the festival run. Uh, since I was a young kid, I had a couple of goals in mind for what I wanted to accomplish through music. And, um, and over the years that always changes because you always seem to want a little bit more and a little bit more, but doing those giant festivals in Europe has always been a bucket list item for me. Um, and I think it is for all of us and we're very excited to get over there. So we've got uh, a couple of festivals. Uh, that we're looking at doing in the summer, and hopefully COVID doesn't shut things down. Uh, we were supposed to do it the last two summers, and it keeps getting postponed, but eventually we're going to get over there, and that's uh, that's a really big highlight that I'm looking forward to. Has it been ever been to Europe before? We've been to Europe uh, once. It's actually our very first tour, uh, tour with Nile and Hate Eternal over there, and uh, our debut album was supposed to come out a month later, but because we were going to do this tour, and it uh, was happening in September, we actually got the album pushed forward so that it was able to come out right at the beginning of that tour. And that was our, that was Vitriol's very first tour, um, was over in Europe. and wasn't scary at all, not intimidating at <laughs> yeah. all, to have your first tour with your musical heroes in a fucking foreign continent you've never been to. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Hey, Turtles actually playing next week at the uh, uh, Metal and Beer Fest uh, mm -hmm. just in um, L.A. Oh, awesome. So just, I'm just going day two, just for Hey, Turtle, honestly, mainly. Yeah, Can we're just playing some other bands, but... To see Eric play, it's he hasn't played too often. I know he's in Cannibal Corpse now, but still, yeah, I, so I jump on any just to see performance. Any if he's playing guitar, you have to go. It's kind of yeah. that thing, you know. Yeah, it's a that guy, man. I mean, he's just. Uh, <laughs> he, I mean, he's just the real deal. I mean, yeah. there's really no other. Like, he's the fucking. That's a man that whose work has inspired me. He's, he's maybe the best example of someone who has not divorced himself from the heart of all of it. You know what I mean? Like he understands why this music is made and he connects with it every night. I mean, I, I watched him every fucking night and he was not performing. You know what I mean? Like he wasn't performing. That's just, his relationship with the music, right? Because it comes from a very real and honest place. And it's like, you can't, even if someone can't articulate that themselves, they can't look and be like, oh, I know why this is enigmatic. And so the gravity of this, they might not know it, but they feel, you feel the gravity, you know? And it's because it's fucking honest, you know? Uh, best, best death metal musician ever. Yeah. Do you have any um, like quick comment about like working with Eric when you recorded? Is there anything that you anything really memorable or something that you just like even helped you grow as a musician, person, drummer, anything? Oh, uh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> Spending <laughs> hours and hours with Eric after recording, you know, um, just hanging out. I was where I learned the most in the studio. Um, I kind of expected some of it. He got more out of me than I ever would have thought, but it was more so the after studio hangs that he taught me so much about being a professional, um, even musicality. Like we would talk about so many different things. So yeah, there's uh, endless lessons to be learned from Eric for real. He's a great mentor. Such a kind very kind and uh, I don't know if he'd appreciate this but tender in his own way you very know he's, so. yeah. he's very I mean he's, I mean, he's, he's molten lava and ice cold you know what I'm saying I mean it's his like, album you know was um, Band of Lost that he did years and years ago that was, oh, yeah. like um, have you heard uh, his project A Loss? <laughs> I feel like a poser. I've never even heard you, that. Oh, he, okay, if you, I mean... He showed me. It's the he said it's the most difficult thing he ever written. It was like, it's like classical, melodic, operatic metal. It's... Okay, you... 
Okay, you want to talk about Tender? Oh, you need... Yeah, oh, it's called it. Absolute Purity. It was in 1999, uh, right after Conquering the Throne. Wow. It's... The duality. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. The last song he does is... It's like this like classical instrumental. Like It's like with like acoustic... I, I yeah. can't explain it. It's on YouTube. You oh, have, have to course. have to oh, find it. Of course. And um, I can't remember her name. She uh, sang in Therion. She was uh, oh, uh, Martina of uh, something. I can't... I'm, her name. And um, yeah... It's uh well, tremendous. Oh, I'm it's so excited. Yeah, he uh, he wrote the yeah uh, um, that he said it was the like, most typical thing like he ever written, and you can hear it like you can hear some of the root and riffs, but the tones and how like melodic and the opera the operatic singing, it is a beauty. Like oh, I'm so excited to check it out. Thank you. Yeah, it's an emotional album. Like it's sensational. Awesome. It's great. Like oh, I'm glad to spread that. Like if I ever yeah. get an interview him someday, like he said. That will happen again at some point. It's been 20 years, so maybe not. But um, if you can do something like that again, that would be tremendous. So, yeah. um, so again, um, any last words? Uh, a couple more days left. Uh, then back home, resting, recharging, and then a big tour in February, March. And I yeah. look at the day. There's like going like two or three days off, I think. The whole I was checking on that. Something like that. So it should be well worth it. Again, that I'll be the Anaheim Chain Reaction Show. I told Adam earlier, awesome. there's a brewery literally... 400 feet away awesome. so from chain reaction so uh, yeah yeah any up. any last words um you guys like to say for anyone um listening and going forward oh, this is always like the uh, the, 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 the I like options beans. are limitless he does like i like beans, beans. Uh, refried black beans refried <laughs> baked black beans pinto kidney whatever you got i'll fucking eat them cannellini beans bean 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 beans <laughs> Yeah, you heard it. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, thank you to everyone who came out uh, on these seven fucking weeks of madness. Uh, the support has inspired us, and uh, uh, we can't wait to fucking do it again and again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. This band so sponsored stop. by Heinz uh, tomato <laughs> beans. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 